Good to see everybody. Hope you are having a great day. Hope you're ready to be in the Word tonight. Um, I have been, you know, every once in a while we send around these sign-up things, you know, for you to volunteer to do things. Um, And we have a good problem, and that is when I do it at prayer time, we don't sign up because y'all are praying. So uh, I was told that it would be better to pass it around to start. And that means you'll be signing your name while I'm preaching, but I trust your multitasking ability, all right? All right, so this is for, um, if you haven't seen it, there's a table in the back, and we are wanting to provide some sweets for our, our uh, Elkhart first responders. Um, so this is to make or buy cookies for our local policemen and firemen, and, uh, and if you would be willing to either make some or buy some, you can sign up. I think some of you already have, yeah, some of you already have, but if you have not and you would like to participate in that, then I would highly recommend it. Um, something similar to, remember, uh, a few years ago when we provided lunch for our teachers, um, this was a way that some of our church veterans wanted to get involved in, in the community, and, uh, and so I would encourage you to, to participate in that. All right? Well, we get to go to Psalm 110 tonight. Do I sound excited? I'm excited. It's short. It's my favorite song. If you're visiting with us, they give me a hard time because I apparently, apparently I say it's my favorite psalm way too much. This is a top five for me. Um, this is quite possibly the most theologically packed uh, Davidic psalm. Very, it, it is short. I mean, especially compared to where we've been lately. We've had some long ones lately. And so comparatively, this one is short. But this is a theologically dense psalm. And uh, I'm excited about it. Um, before we get into it, I want you in your mind, and maybe you'll think of a person, I want you in your mind to think of the ideal leader. The ideal leader. Okay, so maybe you think of a particular, maybe a politician comes to mind, a particular president comes to mind. Um, Maybe you think of a a biblical character. Maybe you think of someone in your life that you know. Um, So having said that, maybe think of the ideal leader. Let's specify it a little bit and think of the ideal leader from an unredeemed, unsaved, unbiblical perspective, okay? So, you know, Christians think that good leaders are, and we we think for good reason, okay? Christians know that good leaders are servants, that good leaders are meek, that good leaders are wise, you know, that good leaders don't rely on themselves, they rely on God, and all of these things. But when I say you know, the natural man, the unsaved person, and even if you were to tap into some of that humanity yourself, think of the ideal leader, what would begin to think of? You tell me, what are some, what are some qualities that we think are necessary for an ideal leader? Honesty, good. Compassion, okay, these are really biblical. I'm, I'm talking, un, I'm like, remember, not so godly, okay? Charismatic, yeah, someone who's exciting and engaging, and maybe they, they dress well, and they've got personality, you know. Yes? Okay. Yeah, so just generally a good example. And that's both, like, that's both good leadership, biblical leadership, and secular leadership. Yeah, so we tend to think of, like, um, athletic people, built people, maybe someone who's cut, right? in shape. Um, We tend to trust people who take care of themselves. Uh, And you even mentioned specifically sports. The world has platformed athletes, whether they should be platformed or not, you know. Now you can be a professional athlete and you're basically an expert on culture, apparently. Um, Rich, right? Good communicator. 
someone who can say things. That, and even on that spectrum, there's, there's, there's different kinds of communication, right? There's clarity, and there's comedy, and there's engagement, and personal connection. But yeah, someone who communicates well. Yes. <laughs> Everyone rises. Yep. Yeah. Um, sometimes, uh, so Joel, if you're online, Joel quoted Mur Murphy's Law for us. You rise to the level of the incompetence, right? Um, what, about, what about physical attractiveness? All right? Yeah. Tall, dark, and handsome, which automatically disqualifies me. <laughs> um, physical attractiveness is huge for our society. I mean, it's, you, you can be beautiful and be made king or queen, and that can be your only quality, you know? Um, yeah, rich, funny, attractive, famous. These are the things we platform as leaders. Um, what kind of leader does, does God's people need? You know, we gave a few biblical parameters. Meekness, wisdom, compassion, humility. But what about theologically? What kind of leader do we need? You just think through the Bible and you think through various times in history, specifically Israel, what kind of leader did Israel need or think they needed? Well, they needed a priest. Why? Because of the covenant. What kind of leader did they think they needed? They think they needed, yeah, they thought they needed a king. Why? Because pagan nations had a king, and it seems to be working for them, which, by the way, it wasn't. So it's amazing how often we adopt the bad things of culture and think that it would work for us as the people of God. Psalm, one, Psalm 110 is God's provision, listen, of the perfect person for us. Psalm 110 is God's provision of the perfect person for us for everything that we need, beyond just leader, but the actually perfect person. So now, having said that, let's read the psalm. It is a short one. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let's pray and then begin to study this powerful, mysterious passage together. Father, I'm thankful for your word, and I'm thankful that it's what we need. We all have difficult lives in some way, confusing, chaotic, painful, needs clarity, and your word provides calm. It provides certainty. It provides clarity. It provides hope. It gives us a place to rest. I pray that you'd help me as we work through a, a difficult text and that we would see Christ 
high and lifted up. And we would pour out our thankfulness to you. Would you forgive us from sin that would keep us from freely hearing from your word? Would you cause a repentance of heart to flow from the scriptures? And would you give us humility before the scriptures that desires change and offers pure worship? And we ask through Christ, amen. I will say from the outset that as excited as I am about the psalm and as beautiful and powerful as, I, as this psalm is, I told you it's a top five, right? Um, it is one of the most challenging psalms that actually in the whole Psalter. Um, there, there are some very complex linguistic things here, and so I'm going to do my best to be as clear as possible. And there's some pretty powerful theology in the text that, that requires we understand some, some things, okay? So let's begin in verses 1 and 2 with the divine declaration, a divine declaration. And even from the outset, you see that if we don't understand the very first line, we, we do not understand the rest of the psalm. We have to understand what's going on in this first line. The Lord says to my Lord. All right, so we have two Lords. And they're both capital L or lowercase, they're both capital L. So we're, we're, both, we're, we're talking in both cases about divinity. The first word here for Lord is the word is the, tr- the traditional word Yahweh. This is God. This is the God of Israel, God of the Old Testament. The second word Lord is a general word that has to do with authority or ruler. So the Lord says to my Lord. So Yahweh is speaking to this other Lord. It's very important that we understand that. It's also very important, having understood that the Lord is speaking to a different Lord, that we note the superscript or the writer of this psalm. It says a psalm of David, correct? Um, There's one commentator who says that uh, there is no more important psalm of David than this one. And the reason we have to understand David's part in this psalm is because we note David's insufficiency throughout the psalm. And because who is the archetype perfect king, or not perfect, but idealized king of the Old Testament? David. I mean, Solomon had his wisdom, but, but David still got, I mean, when the people of Israel think of their, their king, their leader, their idealized leader, like I had us run through idealized leaders, It's David, tall, dark, handsome, powerful, conquering, wise, talented. I mean, David was the full, I mean, poetic genius. David was an incredibly impressive person. One of the most impressive people to ever live. But we have to understand that David is making himself secondary in the theology of this text. Because David points out that it's his Lord that Yahweh is speaking to. The Lord says to my Lord. So David the king is saying, I've got a king. Yahweh is speaking to my Lord. Yahweh is speaking to my king. Who is David's king? To which we would say, I mean, God? Except that it is obvious that David has the throne in mind, royalty in mind, king in mind. Which means he has to be thinking of Messiah. This is one of the most explicit messianic psalms in all of the book. And you get that from the very outset. Sometimes in the psalm, and I love to do this because of how I like to preach, I like to build up to the messianic climax of the psalm. I like to, I like to build up to it. But the psalm makes it very clear from the very outset that David's king has to be a future one. 
The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. So who's speaking here? Yahweh. And who's he speaking to? The Lord. This future Lord. Whoever David's Lord is. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, verse 1, according to some commentators, and I'm going to agree with them, based on its full usage, verse 1, the Lord says uh, to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool, is the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. It's cited in Matthew twenty-two forty-four, 44, Mark 12, 36, Luke 20, 42, and verse 43, Acts 2, 34, and verse 35, Hebrews 1, 13, Matthew 26, 64, Ephesians 1, 20, Colossians 3, 1, Hebrews 1, 3, Hebrews 8, 1, Hebrews 10, 12, Hebrews 12, 2, Hebrews 10, 13, 1 Corinthians 15, 25, Ephesians 1, 22, Hebrews 2, 8, and 1 Peter 3, 22. Shows up a lot. It's an important verse. Why? Because it points out to us the fundamental theological understanding of Messiah in the Old Testament. That this primarily is someone that God has intended, not just that Israel has anticipated. In other words, it's not just Israel constantly going, we need someone better, we need someone better, we need someone better. Recognizing in the Old Testament they always needed someone better. Whether it was Moses who didn't get him into the land. Or David who didn't ultimately defeat and then sinned and then experience the judgment of God on his kingdom. Or Solomon who was, who was rich and wise and fell in sin. And you know what happens with the children and the splitting of the kingdom and, 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 and the priests who constantly took advantage of the people and the prophets who gave a false message. You get it, Israel always needs something better. So they're constantly anticipating something better. But it's not just that Israel anticipates an idealized leader, but it's actually that God has always intended the ideal leader. And the New Testament affirms this. Primarily, it affirms this by using Psalm 110, or not primarily, in major part, it affirms this by using Psalm 110, verse 1. It's a very important verse. And I don't have time to go to all those other passages and, and, and show you how each one of them are used, but you notice that's, that's, that's three of the four gospel writers. Uh, that's uh, the writer of Hebrews, that's two of Paul's letters, uh, and one of Peter's letters. I mean, it's, it's constant. And, 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 uh, and Acts as well, so tw two of Luke's books. It's constant. This is a statement of the ultimate superiority of Messiah. The Lord says, Yahweh says of my Lord, this future king that David is referring to, sit at my right hand. So God says to this Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, you know what a footstool is for our for us, it would be the thing that's already installed on our chair, and you, you, know, you sit down and you kick it up, and you know, your lazy boy gives you your footstool, right? Um, perhaps what you could have in mind better is the only footstool we have in our home is in front of our, um, in front of our rocker, our, our baby rocker. It's got one of those little rocking stools, you know? It's where you put your feet. You wouldn't put your feet on somebody in an honorable position. I wouldn't recommend you put your feet on anybody, right? I mean, even my wife doesn't like my feet, right? You get the point. A footstool is not an honorable thing. So the statement that Jesus will be given absolute authority is a, is a statement of conquering. His feet will be an authority resting on his enemies, on his opposers, on his rejectors. Now having made clear that this is God speaking, there are multiple, there are, there are two statements of God in the text. The first one is a statement from Yahweh to this future king, who we know to be Messiah, that he would make him the supreme authority over all. The second statement we'll get to in verse 4. 
But now what's going to happen is this psalm is going to round out our understanding of this Lord or Messiah. This, this might be the fullest, I'm going to use a long word, Christology of Jesus in the entire Psalter. In other words, the most fully developed theology, theology of Jesus Christ in the, in the whole book of the Psalms. In just seven verses. Verse 2, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. So how do we know that the Lord that David is talking about in verse 1 is a king? Verse 2, so let's look secondly at the conquering king. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning, from the dew of your youth will be yours. Now this is a, there's some very technical terminology here. I'll do my best to just walk you through it. Verse 2 is pretty straightforward. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. God gives to this Lord a scepter or royalty. He is king. But specifically, so he's king in verse 2. But specifically in verse 3, he's a conquering king. Your people will offer themselves freely. Or another way of saying this is they will submit themselves to your authority on the day of your power or on the day of your ruling in holy garments. Uh, And then this phrase, from the womb of the morning, the dew of of your youth will be yours, actually has the idea of quantity from the womb of the morning or the newness of the morning as the morning births dew on the grass so an army will be raised up for this king. In other words, how many blades of grass in your backyard get dew in the, in the early part of the morning? Most all of them, right? I mean, I would... I would dare say all of them. If you break it down that way, you've got a lot of dew droplets in your backyard. And so as the ground gives birth, the the womb terminology, to the dew of the earth, so will rise for this king an army of youth. So what you should have in your mind is a massive army preparing to battle with this king, rallying around their king in holy garments. Almost makes you think of being robed in white and following our conquering king into battle. It's incredibly beautiful picturesque prophecy in the Psalms. Verses 2 and 3, this conquering king answers the question of Israel as they're they're looking for their idealized leader, as David himself, Israel's hero, looks forward to this Lord This conquering king answers the question, who will lead us? So, the Lord says to the Lord, Yahweh says to this Lord, I'm going to give you a scepter, royalty, and you'll be followed by a massive army made new in holy garments. How can these garments be holy? How can they be before the Lord pure? Verse 4, the Lord has sworn. Now this is very significant. We have to understand the statements of the Lord. The first sta- Yahweh, the first statement of the Lord in verse 1 is what? Sit at my right hand. He's speaking to the Lord. Now, the second statement of the Lord in verse 4 is an oath. Do you see that? 
the Lord has sworn. Um, one commentator said uh, about, this, about this verse, the only thing more powerful the only thing more powerful than the command of the Lord in verse 1 is the promise of the Lord in verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Now, I love the fullness of this psalm, and we're going to tie it all together, and you'll see how incredible it is in just a few minutes, but I'm not sure you're seeing how incredible the psalm is, but Every once in a while, you know, I just like to z- z- zoom in on one line. Aren't you thankful that you worship a God that what he has said, he will not change his mind? You can go to sleep tonight and wake up tomorrow with new mercies because he has said His mercies are new every morning, and he will not change his mind. You can face the next day or the next week or the next year, even if it's your hardest day or your hardest week or your hardest year, knowing that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor height nor depth nor any other creature in all creation can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Because he has said it, and he will not change his mind. You can face with your family the most life-altering chaos and walk through peace that passes understanding because Christ guards your hearts and minds. Because he has sworn it, and he will not change his mind. But listen, how are all of those promises even possible? Look at the next line. You are a priest forever. The Lord has sworn, and he will not change his mind, Yahweh is still speaking to this messianic future Lord. You are a priest forever. So, so far we've seen he's a king who will conquer. The idealized leader who will lead us. This future king will lead you. And he will lead you in victory. You can be certain. But who will represent us before God. The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You, Messiah, are a priest forever. So look with me in verse four, now at the perpetual priest, the perpetual priest, the divine declaration, the conquering king and the perpetual priest. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we have to understand who this guy is. Melchizedek is introduced introduced to us in Genesis chapter 14. He is pictured for us as both the king and priest of the people of Salem. He's an important Old Testament person, character, because he represents two aspects. Those two aspects that I just mentioned. He is not just a king, he is also a priest. These are separate offices in in the Old Testament. The prophet brings the message of God before the people. The priest brings the people before God. And the king leads the people, hopefully in a godly way. These are different people in the Old Testament, with the exception of Melchizedek. But note, Melchizedek precedes the setting up of the covenantal system. And in Hebrews chapter 7, if you'll turn there with me, this idea is more fully fleshed out. Look at 
verse 1, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. So Abraham returns this with a blessing. Verse 3, he is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning nor, of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. Verse 11, now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek? In other words, the priest of Levi doesn't do it for us. For when there is a change in priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So we've got a, we've got a law, we've got a covenantal problem. Verse 15, this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent. In other words, he's not inherited. But by the power of an indestructible life. Listen, for it is witnessed of him, Psalm 110, verse 4, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, the former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. What better hope? A better priest. And it was not without an oath. What oath? It was not without an oath. This better priest, this better hope was not without an oath. What oath? oath. Verse 21, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, who's the one? Yahweh. And who is he speaking to? The Lord has sworn and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. And I just love the next verse so much. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Verse 2 and 3, who's going to lead us? The king. Verse 3 and 4, who's going to represent us? The king who is your priest. Just to tie all of these concepts together, as a priest, Jesus sacrificed himself by his death on the cross, which is superior, not like the bulls of blood and goats, which cannot atone for sin, he is not, by extent, not hereditary through Aaron's line, which is a line that failed. He is an eternal high priest. In other words, we don't need more to purify themselves. He's a perpetual priest. And he's a priest not of the old covenant, but a guarantor of the new. And because he is promised as the Davidic king, both office of king and priest are united and perfected in one person, the man Christ Jesus. So, verses two and three, who will lead us? The king. Verses three and four. Verse 4, who will represent us, the priest? And they are one and the same. Which leads us to our vindicating victor. Our vindicating victor. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He's already said that. God has already said, I will make your enemies your footstool. He will execute judgment among the nations filling them with corpses, the nations surrounding uh, Jerusalem, in, in my opinion, in, in the days that are to come. This is, a, a, again, a prophecy of the future. The completed end times, new heaven and new earth, the final judgment that precedes the new heaven and new earth. Verse 7, he will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his 
head. Verse 7 is a fascinating, verse 5 and 6 need no explanation. We understand the day of his wrath or the day of future judgment. This is a a future-oriented psalm. We've already said that. Verse 7, he will drink from the brook by the way. This is a specific Old Testament allusion to Gideon. Remember what Gideon did after he conquered. Do not get this confused with him taking the men down by the water and seeing who would drink in a battle stance. Okay, This is after he has conquered. And they're journeying out and they drink a cup of victory on the departure after conquering. So verse 7 is just another statement of victory. He will drink a cup of victory and he will lift up his head. And how is it possible that the perfect priest and the perfect king will drink the cup of perfect victory? It is because he drank the cup of God's wrath that allows him fully to drink the cup of victory and invite his army to enjoy that victory with him. This is Revelation 19. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire and his head are many diadems. He has a name written that no one but himself knows. He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen. Did you hear that? Holy garments. White and pure. He's clothed in a garment dipped with blood. And his army is arrayed in purest white. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations to make them his footstool. He will strike with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress in the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on the, Psalm 110, day of his wrath, verse 16 of of Revelation 19. On his robe and on his thigh is a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Psalm Psalm 110 is a full Christology of the priesthood of Christ, the kingship of Christ, and the eternal redemptive work of Christ. Verse 2 and 3, who will lead us? Verse 4, who will represent us? Verse 5 through 7, who will get us home? Isn't that, isn't that what Israel wanted? They just wanted the land. Because God said, you'll come into the land. I'll give you the land. But they were unfaithful and they still wanted the land. And God constantly provides them a way to go into the land, even though they were unfaithful and even though they were fearful. They just wanted to go home. Who will get us home? He who reigns righteously represents us perfectly and perpetually and will establish final victory. He will bring us home. And this almost seems trite out of after the the beautiful unfolding theological 
tracing of what God does through Psalm 110, but I just couldn't get this one idea out of my head. You know what Psalm 110 teaches us? Jesus is all we need. Jesus is all we need. Who's going to lead us, Jesus? Who's going to represent us to God? How can we stand, Jesus? How are we possibly going to get home? Jesus. And this theological reality that Jesus is all we need, this divine declaration that he he commands in verse 1 and that he swears in verse 4, the conquering king, the perpetual priest, the vindicating victor, this theological concept that is so profound and beautiful, I mean, this is one of the things that I just love about making sure we see one text, the way that God means it within the whole of the Bible, but, but what this drives us down to, this very simple concept that all we need is Jesus changes everything about us. Because if I believe that Jesus is my conqueror, that he will lead me, And if I believe that he will represent me perfectly and perpetually before God, he is the perfect priest. And if I believe that he will get me home, and if he's all that I need, I can be content. And I don't have to worry. And I can have peace. I can help my children not have anxiety. I can encourage my wife when things get stressful. I can encourage my own heart when things get stressful. If I understand Jesus in the ways that I need him most theologically, the king, the victor, the perpetual priest, then I understand that I have everything in him and I can trust him in every way practically. That I can rest in God. This is his plan. This is God's plan, Yahweh's plan perfected and ratified in Christ. Jesus is all we need. Let's pray. Oh, Father, what a, what a text. What a text. What a beautiful, powerful comforting, hope-filled text. And so I pray that you would use it tonight in the lives of my brothers and sisters. If there's one with us tonight who's not rested in Christ for salvation, would you use this text to challenge them, help them to realize that Christ is all they need to stand before you, He can lead them from sin, away from sin, into eternal life, and he can lead them through this life. And I thank you, Father, for your plan that you did say to the Son that you would would conquer through him. You would give him his enemies. You deserve all the glory for this. And so your people give it. And I ask these things through Christ. Amen. How many of you that's your favorite now? <laughs> well, top five. I mean, that's, isn't God's word just awesome? I mean, and just to think, I didn't even look at one of those tw- 21 cross references. Because we didn't have time. So I, didn't, I did not even go to the other ways that all those biblical writers use this psalm. I mean, that's amazing. God's word is just awesome. All right. Well, let's do, um, we got a few minutes. Let's do a few minutes on how the psalm helps us pray. How does the psalm help us pray? And of course, if it was a particular encouragement to you and you want to share, we'll, we'll take that as well. But how does the psalm help us pray?
Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man, thankful for David and just how the Lord used him. And um, I mean, this is a this is one of those texts that I have a lot of questions about when I get to the new heavens. Like, okay, how how did you know this, David? <laughs> like, was this a vision? Was it? I mean, how did he know all this? Like, how did he see this? How did he know that the Lord said this to the Lord? You know, um, obviously inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He just knew, you know, or he, it's, it's not just poetic wisdom. I mean, obviously, this is where, um, by the way, Spurgeon uses this psalm to talk about, the, you know, the covenant of old, like what happened in heaven, which, by the way, if you ever, I can't remember the name of that sermon, but if you ever want to read a, an incredible sermon, uh, Spurgeon's sermon where he talks about the covenant of redemption, he paints this picture and he creates this scene in heaven about God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit and how God divides up their responsibilities and what they're, I mean, it's just, you know, it's awesome. Only Spurgeon can do that stuff, but all right, I'm very distracted. Uh, how, does, how does it help us pray? <laughs> yes, brother. Yes. Yeah. The greatest of confidence. We pray with the greatest of confidence. I mean, because we're, we're taking things to a king who will re- represent them before God, who takes them to God because he represents us. I mean, it's just, yeah, that's so good. Yeah, yeah, amen. That'll preach. You can do that, Steve. <laughs> Next Sunday school lesson. Yes, Jim. Yep. Amen. Amen. Uh, he's the priest who gave himself. He was himself the offering. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? How's it help us pray? Yes. Yeah. Yep. God, help me just to consider Jesus. Help me to learn Jesus. Help me to see Jesus. Help me to know him and his sufferings. Um, I need to know Jesus. Help me to love Jesus, you know, amen. I think I saw another hand. Yes, brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hebrews 4, yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, uh, and that's both future and present peace, right? I mean, yeah. yeah, we go through times and, man, we're not feeling it. But, you know, the peace of the Lord is promised to us, you know, not something we can just perpetually feel. And, and absolutely. And, and you, you tied the peace to the conquering. 
and to come that peace follows the conquering. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, if you um, you want a Bible study for a year, just get in Psalm 110 and start looking up cross references and uh, read it in, in light of the last few chapters of Revelation. It's just it's awesome. All right. All right. Um, well, let's get into a prayer sheet. <clears throat> Number one there, continue to pray for um, Dan and Kathy and their family as, as um, Kathy's father passed away. Uh, praying for Kathy Schweitzer and Mike and Leslie and Jenna and Jacob. Miss Paul. Miss Paul. Um, Praying for Jeff and Amanda and Jack and Bree. Um, saw Jeff tonight. They were they were taken off very soon. Fly Friday. Yep. Um, just be praying for them. I mean, what a what a what a difficult situation. Be be specifically praying that God uses tragedy to open eyes to the gospel. Um, praising the Lord that Diane is home. If you're watching online, man, we we love you. We're praying for you. Um, Got to drop in yesterday and see her. Um, if you want to be blessed, just go hang out with Diane. <laughs> go to be a blessing and then end up leaving blessed. She's blushing because I'm talking about her, but that's what happens. Um, pray for Lynn. And uh, Lynn had a large area of cancer removed from the top of his head recently. Keep praying for him. Keep praying for Cindy's brother, Doug. Um, We've mentioned John Lidstead there a few times, number six there. Um, keep praying for Diane Clark. Keep playing, uh, praying for Ron Bowers. He um, just has some ongoing health aggravations and uh, trying to nail all that down. Um, some, re some, some helpful recoveries there, uh, or, or things that are going well. Paul Lovelace is doing, doing well. We're praising the Lord for that. And... Uh, and so most of these are, are, are just continued updates, and, uh, um, and so make sure you bring this to the Lord in prayer tonight. Share your struggles, share your burdens with one another, um, and go ahead and break into groups and pray. If I can have that sign-up sheet, wherever that got to. Sandy's got it. She's in the... All right, awesome. All right, go ahead and break into groups and pray. Praise the Lord for His Word and what He's done through Christ, and bring these requests to the Lord.